Welcome. I'm Vita Palladino, director of the Howard Gottlieb Archival Research Center. I thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, we're in for a very spectacular program, and I just want to make a few announcements about various things going on. Um, the Poetry Society has a raffle going. If you just give them your name and address and put it in the box, you will enter for a drawing of a Rita Dove broadside. And uh, where I want to announce tomorrow's program is sponsoring, uh, sponsored by the Howard Thurman Center, is the 40th anniversary of Dr. King's last sermon, I've Been to the Mountaintop. The program is called To the Mountaintop, and the keynote speaker is the, G Nikki Giovanni. It is going to be held uh, at 7 p.m. in this very room. We also have the Inner Strength Gospel Choir singing. Also, I want to announce a new phenomenon. I've been at Boston University 31 years, and I am very proud that the Gottlieb Center is able to sponsor a very important student event. 83 different student groups came together to unite to give on April 26th the first ever Martin Luther King Jr. Peace Concert, also in this room. And any students wishing to buy tickets, that table is right over there in the corner. I'm very proud of our students. Martin Luther King is one of us. He's an alum. He's in a very important part of Boston University, and he inspires us eternally and in many ways. Um, it's an amazing thing to have so many distinguished poets. I'm overwhelmed. Uh, the, the talent in this room is just overflowing. I have the, dis the honor of introducing Boston's first poet laureate, Sam Cornish. He started writing as a teenager Living in Baltimore, Maryland, after serving in the Army Medical Corps, Mr. Cornish moved to Boston during the arts revolution of the 1960s. Inspired by E.E. E. Cummings and T.S. Eliot, he abandoned the notion within the confines of rhyme and meter, and instead writing streetwise observations of his world in free verse. His poetry embodies the African-American experience of the past 70 years, dealing with themes such as slavery, kinship, civil rights, in language as tough as life on the streets. Mr. Cornish has an extensive resume in the field of poetry. He has published 13 books and pamphlets of poetry, been anthologized 25 times, published book reviews in the Boston Herald, Boston Globe, Harvard Book Review, Essence Magazine, and many others, and has met, edited several collections of poetry. In addition, Mr. Cornish received a St. Batolph Society Foundation Award in 1992 from the National Endowment for the Arts, and he was an NEA Fellow in 1967. He was also a faculty member at Emerson College for over 20 years. In 2008, Boston Mayor Thomas Menino named Mr. Cornish the city's first poet laureate. And since then, Mr. Cornish has been the mayor's emissary to bring about new poetry readings and programs throughout Boston. I give you Sam Cornish. Thank you. I want to thank my wife for organizing me. <laughs> First, I would like to extend my thanks to Vita Palladino.
for the opportunity to give this introduction and for doing such a great job in organizing this event. Please allow me to We cannot thank you enough. In view of the number of poets reading, and so they may have enough time as possible, I will be brief. I am particularly grateful to have the opportunity to thank and acknowledge these poets who have had such an impact on our social and political thinking. And what is more remarkable is that it had been done through poetry. I repeat, through poetry. I want especially to draw attention to Ms. Sonia Sanchez and Ms. Nikki Giovanni. Yeah. 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 The earliest practitioners and creators of the new black poetry who brought about such a transition from one perspective to another. In this regard, I would like to mention Margaret Walker and Gwendolyn Brooks. I like to think of them right now, duking it out somewhere. <laughs> I'm better. <laughs> For their contributions to the poetry of my generation, as well as Dudley Randall. Amiri Baraka and Larry Neal. No. I, um, I, just, I remember meeting Larry Neal in the elevator during a conference at this school. And I was being full of piss and vinegar because after all it's the 60s. And Larry in the suit was very calm, a gentleman. Baraka and Neal, whose anthology, Black Fire, collected the prose, poetry, and drama of a new generation of black writers, signaled a change that introduced a new militance into the community and into the mainstream. I would, I would want to mention Dudley Randall uh, and the Broadside Press, which published pamphlets of poetry costing from $1 to $1 and a half. and the previously unpublished poets who were abrasive, political, confrontational, and not to mention having a very wry sense of humor. It was the poetry of the city. If the poets here today were reading in chronological order, perhaps you would get a sense of their influence on me and on many of the days younger writers. For example, the oral traditions that have been prevalent in the black arts movement is evident in today's vigorous performance arts, both written and spoken. As you listen to these poets, ask yourself, are they writing and speaking to one another, to you? And what are they saying? This is, after all, a poetic conversation. I would like to request for the sake of time, and this is not going to happen, but it's, it was my wish that each poet introduce him or herself and allow us to become acquainted with them, not through their credentials, but through their work and their presence on the stage today. Thank you for being here. Thank you, BU. And again, thank you, Margaret Walker. 
and thank you, Dudley Randall, for making me a poet. Hello, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Alexander. Being in tonight's company is really the most beautiful dream. I'm very, very, very honored. And since we mark on Friday the loss of Dr. King, I, I just want to say that uh, I did my master's degree here, and I was a Martin Luther King scholar. That was my scholarship. And, um, and I was very proud of that. So I'm glad to be able to say that right here. Okay, fine company indeed. A new poem. The Elders. Watched him glitter, watched him gleam, shook his unruff hands with their cotton-scarred hands, cut their eyes at him, observed the ease with which he smiled, asked Finally, what is love, and who are the people, and how must we love them, and what do we need? What is now? Look at the lines in the corner of young blood's eyes, lined not unlike our hands. And perhaps this is not gleam, but illumination, not merely his, but ours. This is a poem called Narrative Ali, uh, and it's about, it's in the imagined voice of Muhammad Ali. And I chose to write about him for a million different reasons. Um, but the three that strike me uh, was that uh, he was a black man in process in the time period that this, this is written, um, of defining himself as a global black man. That he proclaimed his beauty and thus the beauty of black men to the world uncompromisingly and that he said no to war and willingly paid the price, and there was a real price. So this is Narrative Ali, a poem in 12 rounds. One, my head so big they had to pry me out. I'm sorry, bird, is what I call my mother. Cassius, Marcellus, Clay, Muhammad Ali, you can say my name in any language, any continent, Ali. Two. Two photographs of Emmett Till born my year on my birthday. One, he's smiling, happy, and the other one is after. His mother did the bold thing, kept the casket open, made the thousands look upon his bulging eyes, his twisted neck, her lynched black boy. I could not sleep for thinking Emmett Till. One day I went down to the train tracks, found some iron shoeshine rests and planted them between the ties and waited for a train to come and watch the train derail and ran and after that I slept at night. Three, I need to train around people, hear them talk, talk back. I need to hear the traffic, see people in the barbershop, people getting shoeshines, talking, hear them talk, talk back. Four, Bottom line, Olympic gold can't buy a black man a Louisville hamburger in 1960. Wasn't even real gold. I watched the river drag the metal down, red, white, and blue. Five, laying on the bed, praying for a wife, in walk Sanji Roy. Pretty little shape, do you like chop suey? Can I wash your hair underneath that wig? Lay on the bed, girl, lie with me. Shake to the east, to the north, south, west, but remember, remember, I need a Muslim wife. So quit using lipstick, quit your boogaloo, cover up your knees like a Muslim wife. Religion, religion, a Muslim wife. 11 months with Sanji, first woman I loved. Six, there's not too many days that pass that I don't think of how it started, but I know no great white hope can beat a true black champ. Jerry Quarry could have been a movie star, a millionaire, a senator, a president. He only had to do one thing, is whoop me. But he can't. Seven, dressing room visitor. 
He opened up his shirt, KKK cut in his chest. He dropped his trousers, latticed scars where testicles should be. His face bewildered, frozen in the Alabama woods that night in 1966 when they left him for dead, his testicles in a Dixie cup. You a warning, they told him, to smart mouth, sassy acting niggers, meaning niggers still alive, meaning any nigger, meaning niggers like me. Eight, training. Unsweetened grapefruit juice will melt my stomach down. Don't drive if you can walk, don't walk if you can run. I add a mile each day and run in eight pound boots. My knuckles sometimes burst the glove. I let dead skin build up and then I peel it, let it scar so I don't bleed as much. My bones absorb the shock. I train in three minute spurts like rounds. Three rounds, big bag, three speed bag, three jump rope, one minute breaks, no more, no less. Am I too old? Eat only kosher meat. Eat cabbage, carrots, beets, and watch the weight come down. 230, 220, 210, 209. Nine. Will I go like Kid Perrette, a fractured skull, a 10-day sleep, dreaming, alligators, pork chops, saxophones, slow grinds, funk, fish bowls, light bulbs, bars, bats, typewriters, tuning forks, funk, clocks, red rubber ball, what you see in that lifetime knockout minute on the cusp? You could be let go. You could be snatched back. 10, rumble in the jungle. Ali Bomaye, Ali Bomaye means kill him, Ali, which is different from a whooping, which is what I give. But I lead them chanting anyway, Ali Bomaye, because here in Africa, black people fly planes and run countries. I'm still making up for the foolishness I said when I was Clay from Louisville, where I learned Africans lived naked in straw huts eating tiger meat, grunting and grinning, swinging from vines, pounding their chests. I pound my chest, but of my own accord. 11. I said to Joe Frazier, first thing, get a good house in case you get crippled so you and your family can sleep somewhere. Always keep one good Cadillac. And watch how you dress with that cowboy hat, pink suits, white shoes. That's how pimps dress or kids. And you a champ or wish you were because I can whip you in the ring or whip you in the street. Now, back to clothes, wear dark clothes, suits, black suits, like you the best at what you do, like you president of the world, dress like that. Put them yellow pants away. <laughs> we dinosaurs gotta look good, gotta sound good, gotta be good, the greatest, that's what I told Joe Frazier. And he said to me, we both bad niggers, we don't do no crawling. 12, they called me the fistic pariah. They said I didn't love my country, called me a race hater, called me out of my name, waited for me to come out on a stretcher, shot at me, hexed me, cursed me, wished me all manner of ill will, told me I was finished. Here I am, like the song says, come and take me. The people's champ, myself, Muhammad. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Can you hear me? Thank you, Sam. Uh, thank you, Vita and Alice. And thank you all. Good evening. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Toy Derricotte, and um, uh, I'm part of the Kavi Kanem crew. I guess I could say that about myself. Um, and just to talk about my writing a little bit, um, my great-grandmother was born uh, three years after slavery. She was a washwoman. And in three generations, we went from that place to the first black middle-class suburb of Detroit, Conant Gardens. 
uh, it, was a, it was a tough journey. My, my grandmother died at 43 scrubbing a floor for a wealthy family that she worked for. Um, there was so much beauty and so much power in that journey. And there was also a lot of secrets. Those secrets were a necessary part of that moment in time. But I, I started to feel that the secrets were also harming the people that they were most meant to protect. And so some of these secrets were about sexuality, they were about color, they were about class. And um, I spent 30 years working on a book called The Black Notebooks, which is really about the inner wound that has to do with self-loathing and race. And so I'm just going to read a, a little part of the um, intro, and then I'll read a poem. I began writing this book in the middle of a severe depression. My husband and I had just moved into an all-white middle and upper-class neighborhood 10 miles from New York City. I had spent months looking at houses over 80, and I had decided not to take my husband with me to the real estate offices, because when I had, since he is recognizably black, we had been shown houses in entirely different neighborhoods, mostly all black. I had soon found that houses in the best neighborhoods, perhaps like the produce and meat in the best supermarkets, are comparatively less expensive. At night, under cover of darkness, I would take him back to circle the houses that I had seen, and I would describe the insides. I am the kind of person who can cut her finger in a serious way, or bruise, or burn myself badly, and not remember how or when it was done. I have trained myself in a very distinct way of forgetting. Living in a neighborhood in which I was inescapably weighted and bound by race, in which I was the known black person, I felt entirely different from my previous experience in the white world, a world in which I am usually invisible. My husband says that most black people learn they can't escape from their skin in childhood. I didn't learn it until then. I began to be conscious that my reaction to hearing a comment in a shoe store or seeing a young black boy on the street was a reaction of fear. My adrenaline would increase the fight or flight response as if a part of me wanted to jump out of my skin. A dark man who had been a Marine told me how, after six weeks of boot camp, during which time he wasn't allowed to look in a mirror, he came upon himself in an uncovered mirror and was filled with dread and sadness. He had forgotten he was black. I wanted to get away not only from that black person who seemed to be the catalyst of my feelings, but more to the point to get out of my own mind from those thoughts and feelings I so loathed in myself. My reactions were not rational, not thought. They seemed to be as visceral as instinct. James Baldwin said, the white man needs the nigger because he cannot tolerate the nigger in himself. But does the black man too need the nigger? I sense that the structures that hold us together as a society and create devastating realities may be built around the most basic instincts of self, for self-preservation. These structures must originate even before conscious memory because I truly cannot remember the first time I learned I was black. It is as if every experience I have had of realizing I am black, all the way back to grade school and before, when I used to wander undetected across Conant Avenue to where the Polish people lived, is tainted with that fear of discovery, of being recognized as black. So many black people spoke of hatred for them, for those niggers who were messing it up for the rest of us. It is self-hating and destructive, but racism is insane, and surviving it we have often had to think in desperate ways. 
Forget sounds like such a passive act, but anyone who has experienced the powerful force of repression will know the effort it takes to unforget, to remember. I began to be aware of that state of consciousness that so alarmed me, that remembering of myself as a black person. I began to keep track of it, to write of it in my journals. I believed that my unconsciousness of my blackness, my forgetting, was symptomatic of some deep refusal of self, a kind of death wish. And I felt that my symptoms, however much I was alarmed by them, carried some real and essential message that, once acknowledged, I could eventually accept and understand. Of course, these writings were private. I told no one. I was especially afraid that other blacks would discover my shameful feelings. My writing was an expiation, a penance. It was a way I gained distance and control. It was finally a way to transform what I hated and denied into something beautiful and true. Ironically, it became the way I took on publicly and irrevocably the very identity I was ambivalent about. I didn't do this out of desire. Desire would never be enough to sustain such explorations. I did it to save my life. Thank you. Does it make you shameful to speak of shame? And I'll just read this poem, Invisible Dreams. And it starts with a quote from Renee Schar. The poet is a percep per the poet is a perpetual insomniac, just like me. <laughs> There's a sickness in me. During the night, I wake up, and it's brought a stain into my mouth, as if an ocean has risen and left back a stink on the rocks of my teeth. I stink. My mouth is ugly, human, stink. A color like rust is in me. I can't get rid of it. It rises after I brush my teeth, a taste like iron. In the night, left like a dream, a caustic light washes over the insides of me. What to do with my arms? They coil out of my body like snakes. They branch and spit. I want to shake myself until they fall like withered roots until they bend the right way, until I fit in them or they in me. I have to lay them down as carefully as a, an old wedding dress. I have to fold them like the arms of someone dead. The house is quiet. All night I struggle, all because of my arms, which have no peace. I'm a martyr, a girl who's been dead 2,000 years. I turn on my left side like one comfortable after a long, hard death. The angels look down. She's sleeping, they say, and pass me by. But all night, I am passing in and out of my body on my naked feet. I'm awake when I'm sleeping, and I'm sleeping when I'm awake, and no one knows, not even me, for my eyes are closed to myself. I think I am thinking I see a man beside me, and he thinks in his sleep that I'm awake writing. I hear a pen scratch a paper. There is some idea I think is clever. I want to capture myself in a book. I have to make a place for my body in my body. I'm like a dog pawing a blanket on the floor. I have to turn and twist myself like a rag until I can smell myself in myself. I'm sweating. The water is pouring out of me like silver. I put my head in the crook of my arm like a brilliant moon. The bones of my left foot are too heavy on the bones of my right. They lie still for a little while, sleeping, but soon they bruise each other like angry twins. Then the bones of my right foot command the bones of my left to climb down. Thank you.
I'm Cornelius Eady. I am also part of the, <laughs> the that's my one fan, and uh, uh, <laughs> that's my second fan. I'm, I'm also part of the, <laughs> no, it's not. I was not uh, fishing for a compliment, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm also part of the Kavik Hanum family as well. Um, I'm going to read um, a piece from an unpublished memoir, untitled unpublished memoir, maybe as a way of introduction. Um, I grew up in Rochester, New York. Uh, my family came up from Florida. Both, both sides of my family came, came from Florida. Uh, but I grew up in, up north. And uh, uh, the memoir is uh, concerned with um, the period of time before um, I became a poet. And the first thing I'm going to read is a uh, true story of the first time I had any contact with poetry in any way, shape, or form. It's called poetry. Poetry. It's Valentine's Day, fourth grade, Nathaniel Rochester, school number three. Today, we learn about poetry. Mrs. Edwards, our teacher, who is my age now, but very old then, had reached a unit in her teaching guide concerning rhyme and meter. But I already know what I need to know. Like a good kid, my body automatically squirms at the word. Why? Have I ever read a poem before this? No, neither has any other child in the class, but the word just has that sound about it, like vegetables. <laughs> that makes us want to shove our hands in our pockets and pout. It's a grown-up word, a suck-the-fun-from-out-of-the-room word, <laughs> like behave. Every kid winces as if the lips of a dreaded ant were upon them. Today, class, Mrs. Edwards says in that hopeful tone I've grown to use myself over the years, you will choose a valentine and write them a poem. But no one loves anybody this morning. The word, poetry, has clammed our affection up. Mrs. Edwards, however, has this going for her. She comes prepared. She is the third teacher we've had so far this year. Our first grew ill or pregnant, our second young, idealistic, maybe fresh from college, only lasted a few days. We could smell her fear. <laughs> she wanted to be our friend, which is the weakest thing a new teacher could ever do. One afternoon, in the middle of a lesson she knows we're not listening to, her voice begins to crack. Then she begins to sob. Her weeping eyes look out on a class that holds absolutely no pity. Twenty odd smug faces asking, what are you doing here? She slams her book on the desk and runs. Pleasure buzzes among ourselves. In the war between grown-ups and kids, this day is a lock of Custer's scalp. <laughs> Mrs. Edwards understands that the only things a fourth grade class will understand is respect, earned through a little unspecified fear. Some people have a voice that tells a kid, don't try it. <laughs> Mrs. Edwards lets us hear this voice on her first day with us. This is why, for this new exercise, we will moan quietly in our heads and take out a sheet of paper. Poetry. <laughs> Mrs. Edwards, not wanting to waste all morning on this, has taken pity on us by writing out a group of words on the blackboard that end in the letter S. Use the words on the board, she says, to write your poem. Give the poem to your valentine, or if you're too shy, to Mrs. Edwards, who will pin them unsigned on the bulletin board. Our dumb pencils skate the paper. We shift in our seats. We sniffle bored. Why do they ask this stuff of us? What do they want to know? How nosy can you get? <laughs> Out of the forest near silence, the low rumble of business in the other classrooms, the sound of fingers brushing away erased words, the awful tick of the wall clock, come four lines into my head. S-O-S, I'm in a mess. And I need you, I must confess. <laughs> Is that it? Just what she wants? 
I'd rather be in gym class, bunched up in a corner with the rest of the skinny boys, fighting for our lives against the jocks in a game of dodgeball. <laughs> Good, says Mrs. Edwards when she reads it. Where does it go? In some young girl's hand who couldn't care less, and I don't remember. And somehow, somewhere, deep in my wannabe, a soldier, fireman, doctor, head. I'm going to read one more poem, and it's so I'm going to have a poem of the moment, um, being um, reminded that um, this is the anniversary of, of Martin Luther King's um, mountain speech. And here we are, uh, years later, um, maybe that close to having an African American uh, as president. We should celebrate that. It's good. It's not going to solve everything if it happens, but it, 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 it's something to note. <laughs> so, and this is a, this is a this is a, a poem that predates Kavi Kalam, but seems to uh, fit. Sometimes you the poem knows more than the poet, as someone once told me, and um, and this is probably in a way uh, a, a looking out for that space before it happened. It's after I left grad school. It's called Gratitude. Gratitude. I'm here to tell you an old story. This appears to be my work. I live in the world, walk the streets of New York, this dear city. I want to tell you. I'm 36 years old. I have lived in and against my blood. I want to tell you. I am grateful because, after all, I am a black American poet. I'm 36, and no one has to tell me about luck. I mean, after a reading, someone asked me once, if you weren't doing this, what, if anything, would you be doing? And I didn't say what we both understood. I'm a black American male, I own this particular story on this particular street at this particular moment. This appears to be my work. I'm 36 years old, and all I have to do is repeat what I notice over and over. All I have to do is remember. And to the famous poet who thinks literature holds no small musics, love. And to the publishers who believe in their marrow, there is no profit in the fringes. Love. And to those who need the promise of wind, the sound of branches stirring beneath the line, here's another environment poised to open. Everyone reminds me what an amazing odyssey I am undertaking as well they should. After all, I am a black American poet and my greatest weakness is an inability to sustain rage. Who knows what'll happen next? This appears to be one for the books if you train your ears for what's unstated beneath the congratulations. That silence is my story, the pure celebration and shock of my face defying its gravity, so to speak. I claim this tiny glee not just for myself, but for my parents who shook their heads. I am older now than my father was when he had me, which is no big deal, except I have personal knowledge of the wind that tilts the head back and I claim this loose seed in the air glee on behalf of the social studies teacher I had in the 10th grade, a real bastard who took me aside after class the afternoon. He heard I was leaving for a private school just to let me know he expected me to drown out there, that I held the knowledge of the drowned man, the regret of ruined flesh in my eyes, which was fair enough, except I believe I've been teaching now far longer now than he had that day, and I know the blessing of a narrow escape. 
and I claim this rooster pulled down morning glee on behalf of anyone who saw me coming and said, yes, even when I was loud, cocky, insecure, even when all they could have seen was the promise of a germ, even when it meant yielding ground. I am a bit older than they were when I walked into that room or class or party and I understand the value of the unstated push. A lucky man gets to sing his name. I have survived long enough to tell a bit of an old story and to those who defend poetry against all foreign tongues love. And to those who believe a drop clause signifies encroachment, love. And to the bullies who need the musty air of the clubhouse all to themselves, I am a brick in a house that is being built around your house. I'm 36 years old, a black American poet. Nearly all the things that weren't supposed to occur has happened anyway, and I have a natural inability to sustain rage despite the evidence. I have proof, and a job that comes as simple to me as breathing. Thank you. I'm Nikki Giovanni. I'm a big fan of history and I'm a big fan of, of looking at things differently. And as a black American, one of the things that we look at, I think totally incorrectly, has been slavery because we've looked at it from the point of view of what it did do for the people who did it, not what it did do for the people who came through it. Okay, and things have to change because I'm getting tired of everybody doing everything from the point of view of the people who benefit from it. We have to deal with the point of view, the point of, view of the people who are creative despite it. And so you gotta love black people. There's no downside to black people because look at what we've done with what we didn't have. <laughs> it's true. I'm a big fan of space because we have to go into space because if we don't go into space, we're gonna stay here on, on earth with each other and we're crazy and we're just gonna get crazier and that's really very obvious. We need to do something new, and Mars is our neighbor, but then so is Iraq, so hopefully we will do a little better with Mars and... <laughs> I just thought I'd mention that. I wrote a poem, it's called Quilting the Black Eyed Pea, We're Going to Mars. We're going to Mars for the same reason Marco Polo rocketed to China, for the same reason Columbus trimmed his sails with on a dream of spices, for the very same reason Shackleton was enchanted with penguins, for the reason we fall in love. It's the only adventure. We're going to Mars because Perry couldn't go to the North Pole without Matthew Henson, because Chicago couldn't be a city without Jean-Baptiste de Sabo, because George Washington Carver and his peanut were the right partners for Booker T. It's a life-seeking thing. We're going to Mars because whatever is wrong with us will not get right with us, so we journey forth carrying the same baggage, but every now and then leaving one little bitty thing behind. Maybe drop lynching Billy Bud there, maybe drop torturing hunchbacks here, maybe not whipping Uncle Tom to death, maybe resisting global war, one day looking for prejudice to slip, one day looking for hatred to tumble by the wayside, one day maybe the whole community will no longer be vested in who sleeps with whom, maybe one day the Jewish community will be at rest, the Christian community will be content, the Muslim community will be at peace, and all the rest of us will get great meals at holy days <laughs> and learn new songs and sing in harmony. We're going to Mars because it gives us a reason to change. If Mars came here, it would be ugly. Nations, <clears throat> nations would band together to hunt down and kill Martians. And being the stupid, undeserving life forms that we are, we would also hunt down and kill what would be termed Martian sympathizers. As if the fugitive slave law wasn't bad enough then, 
as if the so-called war on terrorism isn't pitiful now. When do we learn and what does it take to teach us? Things cannot be what we want, when we want, as we want. Other people have ideas and inputs and why won't they leave Rap Brown alone? The future is ours to take. We're going to Mars because we have the hardware to do it. We have the rockets and the fuel and the money and the stuff. And the only reason NASA is holding back is they don't know if what they send out will be what they get back. So let me slow this down. Mars is one year of travel to get there, plus one year of living on Mars, plus one year to return to Earth, equals three years of Earthlings, being in a tight space, going to an unknown place with an unsure welcome awaiting them, tired muscles, unknown and unusual foods, harsh conditions, and no known landmarks to keep them human, only a hope and a prayer that they will be shadowed beneath the benign hand, and there is no historical precedent for that except this. The trip to Mars can only be understood through black Americans. Let's say, the trip to Mars can only be understood through black Americans. The people who were captured and enslaved immediately recognized the men who chained and whipped them and herded them into ships so tightly packed there was no room to turn, no privacy to respect, no tears to fall without landing on another. We're not kind and gentle and concerned for the state of their souls, no. The men with whips and chains were understood to be killers feared to be cannibals, known to be sexual predators. The captured knew they were in trouble in an unknown place without communicable abilities with a violent and capricious species. But they could look out and still see signs of home. They could still smell the sweetness in the air. They could see the clouds floating above the land they loved. But they, re they reached a point where the captured could not only not look back, they had no idea which way back might be. There was nothing in the middle of the deep blue water to indicate which way home might be. And that was the moment when a decision had to be made. Do they continue forward with a resolve to see this thing through, or do they embrace the waters and find another world? In the belly of the ship, a moan was heard, and someone picked up that moan, and a song was raised, and that song would offer comfort and hope and tell the story. When we go to Mars, it's the same thing. It's middle passage. When the rocket red glares, the astronauts will be able to see themselves pull away from Earth. As the ship goes deeper, they will see a sparkle of blue. And then one day, not only will they not see Earth, they won't know which way to look. And that's why NASA needs to call black America. They need to ask us, how did you calm your fears? How were you able to decide you were human, even when everything said you were not? How did you find the comfort in the face of the improbable to make the world you came to your world? How was your soul able to look back and wonder? And we will tell them what to do. To successfully go to Mars and back, you will need a song. Take some Billie Holiday for the sad days and some Charlie Parker for the happy ones, but always keep at least one good spiritual for comfort. You will need a slice or two of meatloaf. And if you can manage it, some fried, chick fried chicken in a shoebox with a nice, moist lemon pound cake. A bottle of beer, because no one should go that far without a beer. <clears throat> and maybe a six pack, so that, that if there is life on Mars, you can share. Popcorn for the celebration when you land, while you wait on your land legs to kick in. And as you climb down the ladder from your spaceship to the Martian surface, look to your left. And there you'll see a smiling community quilting a black-eyed pea watching you descend. Good evening. This is um, from a letter to Brooks. And, um, oh, thank you. I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm Major Jackson. I know who I am. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, from Letter to Brooks. I'm going to read two sections of it and one new poem real quick. Uh, Miss Brooks died December 2000, and um, nine months later was my birthday, and two days after that was uh, September 11th. O oh, Orpheus, grant the skills to stir the dead, like Kanye mixing music with fire, spitting souls through wires. Let me show for the true and living through muck and mire. Rescue the underground so they aim higher, 
Grant the gift to chisel words like De Beers. Let words dangle verbal gems for their ears. I put a premium on rhymes, how could I not? Living the times of the super MCs where styles of deaf lyrics fly, tight the way our minds move over beats and grooves. Our brain matters amped, mic check so we non-stop. My spirit feels echoes thanks to hip hop. I thought to send a note to Tupac then wondered if he's there with you. Rumor has it he's far from dead that in fact he lives like Asada in Cuba, having fled death row. His mask consumes us still. A rapper shot, a martyr is born, sad, not the man, but the image we mourn. A cafeteria was all one needed, a beatbox firm as the heart. We begin a flow, spitting rhymes that superseded our, tertures, our teacher's verdict. Dim-witted children who'll never taste Marchand de Vin. Rap's dawning was the Earth's reality to give a sound to a collective necessity, couched in that we of the real, always keeping it. Those hallway leanings, those attitudinal grace, that much future you heard, that sugar on the hill ganging up airways, those public enemy freedom phrases, those boogie downs and big daddy canes, those diggable planets and Afro names that Rakim and Mr. Eric B or disposable heroes of hypocrisy, that salt and pepper and Roxanne, Roxanne, West Coast Coolio and fisted ex-clans, those questing tribes spitting concertos of the desperados but the boom baps the gone jiggy, and every other word is ho or niggy, nicka, still all the same one frame of the nation that spells hunger like a straw to the brain, video poison normalizes the game. So our children point guns, so we need life like the Fujis need Lauren. election year, right? Gwen, I am glad you're not living at this hour, for we are like the kid pushed in a yard who pushes back, then finding his power becomes the bully with no regard for what hates he sows. How soon our scars fade, the light of an empire ages, daily seas rumble below, repeating man's history. September triggered a rash of abuses all around. I'm concerned for Langston's future. We are not rich enough to avoid conscription. He'll earn his stripes, I hope, by not harming other parents' children, but performing acts of diplomacy, which today smack of the dress rehearsal before the attack. How would you have responded? Images of men and women beheaded or stacked before a camera, the mental war waged in our name. Who foretold the carnage or the beast beneath our skin? How we proclaim civility, then digitize the cave whence we came. Our psyche takes the beating. Six hooded Iraqis lurk behind us in our dreams. When the ax swings, we awakened, doomed to not hear the Sanskrit above our screams. My grandfather came on the scene the same year as you, stunning to think of the horrors of the century in his head. In a corner, the child in him crouches as the room darkens. He was born to a world at war and expects to die a night of bombs evening the score. When I fire up my laptop, he shirks and cannot take more of the world at work. Enough electric spanking, he seems to say, nor belie believes men on the moon to this day. Question, how much headway can we take? Are we advancing faster than our blood courses? Much we've already taken at a lightning pace over flooding perhaps what our brains can endure. You'd giggle at the breakthroughs of the past, of the past decade. For one, robots disarming bombs in caves. The wireless world we live permits instant admission. The internet shrinks the globe. We've hot spots to our bank accounts, the Hague stores, our homes. I can disrobe on a beach and never cease the work mode. We've developed at last alternative ways to move our cars. 
hybrid engines free us all the more from excessive costs at the pump. And now fin de siècle despair of OPEC siphoning of American pockets. I predict once we're through altogether with oil, the only f vehicles left to fuel will be machines of war. And our children sure to become Lowe's ghosts orbiting forever on a big screen, a reality show we will likely sell to the public as a means of swelling national pride and our time a hollow value the gist zap from the red, white, and blue. Of TVs, we hunger for bigger screens, better sounds. XM and Sirius broaden the waves with satellites and crystal clear tunes or the news. The man in Tiananmen Square and I can synchronize more than our thirst for democracy. We can get our fill on Dylan, Coldplay, and Cypress Hill. Kids no longer devour dots. Gaming videos turn them to fighters who hunt bad guys. Fully armed imaginary worlds like Halo ensure no one different catches the prize. In Grand Theft Auto, we've devised squalid streets that let us explore the thug within. And so soccer moms learn to jack rides for drugs. Computer chips are smaller than fingerprints. We've acronyms for it all. With GPS, you never guess where you're going. With Sprint phones, just about anyone can be a spy. Every cell is a cam, and every cam an eye. An unmanned spacecraft landed on Mars. iPods will never leave us without a song. My students walk the quad like Martians. Biotech firms go cloning along. Stem cells can remake our bones strong. We are mapping the human genome. We'll soon design kids to match our homes. I looked you up this morning. 81,000 results with audio links, biographies, profiles, and pics. Your life summed and presented to the tyro in a blink. Substitute the Cartesian logic, I think, to I Google, therefore I am. And you've uncovered our zeitgeist, the groove of an era, our mark on earth measured in binary codes, not by deeds, which totaled many for you. So many claim your sway, treasure your artful phrasings and praise, fell under your spell like electricity to thunder. I, like them, value you above all else, indispensable poet of the public's health. I begin this stop all wrong. You should be here, living at this hour. We need your bolts and resounding poems like we need sweet honey and the rock's sacred songs, a revolt against plain figurings, new and bold metaphors to help us keep people always in vision to fight the corporate bugs away. A love poem, Smoke. I looked up for help, theater of the absurd, the sky. Between a vote and a country, I prefer the sky. That summer we biked to the lake, ate green apples and brie. Then your lips to my ears, I misheard the sky. Your moans came like fisted clouds. I held my breath, an opus of clapping hands stirred the sky. Mornings, men stood on trading floors. Buildings tumbled down. How disturbed the sky. We blushed, we kissed, we had tender fathers. In the absence of proof, we learned to Kierkegaard the sky. When we send up prayers, sing our love to the moon, aren't we bombarding the sky? Until we met, I looked upon you like a deacon, then my blood overheard the sky lay back on the hood of a car, satellites passed by. Longing made it easy for us to postcard the sky. The horizon darkens like a spilled ink from a major bottle. Live among the flowers, learn to shepherd the sky. Thank you.
I'm Yusuf Kamanyake. The devil comes on horseback. Although the sandy soils restored over. Although the sandy soil is already red, the devil still comes on horseback at midnight with all obscenities in his head gall galloping along a pipeline that ferries oil to the black tankers headed for Sh Shanghai, traveling through folklore and songs prayers and curses. He's a windmill of torches and hot lead, rage and plunder, blood lust and self-hatred rising out of the seven odes, a crow of the Arabs. Let them wing and soar. Let them stumble away on broken feet. Let them beg with words of the unborn. Let them strung, a dusty ood of gut and gourd. Still the devil rise, rides a shadow at daybreak. Pity one who doesn't know his bloodline is rape. He rides with a child's heart in his hands, a head on a crooked staff, and he can't stop charging the night sky till his own dark face turns into ashes riding a desert wind's mirage. Grenade. And there's no rehearsal to turn flesh into dust so quickly. A hair trigger, a cock hammer in the brain, a split second between man and infant infamy. It lands on the ground. A few soldiers duck and the others are caught in a half run. And one throws himself down on the grenade. All the watches stop. A flash, smoke, silence. The sound fills the whole day. Flesh and earth fall into the eyes and mouths of the men. A dream trapped in midair. They touch their legs and arms, their groins. Ears and noses sound. What happened? Some are crying. Others are laughing. Some are almost dancing. Someone tries to put the dead man back together. He just dove on the damn thing, sir. A flash, smoke, silence, the day blown apart. For those who can walk away, what is their burden? Shreds of flesh and bloody rags gathered up and stuffed into a bag. Each breath belongs to him, each song, each curse, every prayer is his. Your body doesn't belong to your mind and soul. Who are you? Do you remember the man left in the jungle? The others who owe their lives to this phantom, do they feel like you? Would his loved ones remember him if that little stature or part erected in his name didn't exist and does it enlarge their lives? You wish he had lied down in that closed coffin and not wander the streets or enter your bedroom at midnight the woman you love, she'll never understand who would. You remember what he used to say. If you give a kite too much strain, it'll break free. That unselfish certainty. But you can't remember when you began to live his unspoken dreams. And, and just the... um. The opening and the closing sections of um, um, autobiography, My Alter Ego.
You see these eyes. You see this tongue. You see these ears. They can erect, they can detect a quiver in the grass, an octave higher or lower, a little different, an iota, but they are no different than your eyes and ears. I can't say I don't know how Lady Liberty is tilted in my favor or yours, that I don't hear what I hear and don't see what I see in the cocksure night from Jefferson and Washington to Terrace in hoods and sheets and a black man's head. As he feels what's happening, you can also see and hear what's happening to him. You see these hands, they know enough to save us. I'm trying to say this, true, I'm a cover artist's son, born to read between lines, but I also know that you know a whispered shatter in the trees is the collective mind of insects, birds, and animals witnessing what we do to each other. Forgive the brightly colored viper on the footpath garden, a forgotten shrine. Forgive the tiger dumbstruck beneath his own rainbow. Forgive the spotted bitch eating her litter underneath the house. Forgive the boar hiding in October's red leaves. Forgive the stormy sentry of crows calling to death. Forgive the one who conjures a god out of spit and clay so she may seek redemption. Forgive the elephant's memory. Forgive the salt vine and the thorn bird's litany. Forgive the schizoid gatekeeper, his law book's perfect excuse. Forgive the crocodile's swiftness. Forgive the pheromones in the idea of life on Mars. Forgive the heat lightning in the powder keg. Forgive the raccoon's sleight of hand beside the river. Forgive the moon calf and doubt's call baby. Forgive my father's loss in his hat, tongue. Forgive my mother's intoxicated lullaby. Forgive my sixth sense. Forgive my heart and penis, but don't forgive my hands. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dawn Lundy Martin. Um, first, I'm going to read actually two uh, excerpts from longer poems, and the first poem is called "After Drowning." And at the time, I was considering kind of, you know, um, how to uh, write, you know, different kind of identity claims in in poetry. And um, a friend of mine asked me to do a um, uh, to kind of um, conjure it on stage at a theater. Um, and so uh, that space influenced the, this particular writing after drowning. Depart, pinprick, pry back kind resistance, develop it and say something incomprehensible. She put on her soft body. She was grafted in particulars, patterns, a distinct location, a place various, more various, she said, and in saying, spilled over into the body's many parts. Fell for the sake of it and found there at the bottom of the pit, a stool to sit on, a hand to wring, palate spun, a thing pernicious, perceived as such and was such, dangled on the tip of stick drip. She 
curdles in the crawl, could lactate only stopping when the being is full up penned in with foul, with fur, dereliction, impossible, yet the thing, the one absolution from the designed body. As if one could locate here in the barnyard a logic, a wonder, a stabbing toward datum corpus. What is it like to feel female? explicitly, a body that feeds, is food, is gnawed on, one that kneels, a facilitator, organized joy, a corporeal craving in arranging the joist cooing. She said, when I fuck them, I think I can make them love me. I said, when I fuck them, I think I can get something back. What is mumbled after the act? I, uh, after the craving empties, when viscosity permeates a life before magenta and falling there through sound through tape, a voice ghostly saying blackly, I bleed, this is what it takes, I hear it now, know it. There was once a time when the bridge ended and the girl leapt. There was once a singing somewhere. Um, this is from uh, a um, new project that I'm working on called Disciplines. I'm not sure what it is yet, but I'll just read it to you anyway. <laughs> so it's, it's actually a book-length poem. I do know that, and I'll read you just a little bit from it. Brackish dances, bodies in uncommon strobes. What mystery in jaunty bodies or are they murderous bodies? Who can tell? I can't tell. Streaming video, private locations, large hard hands inserted in zippers. There's an unrecognizable scent. There were, are, a, we, there, a timeless we, a we of all on a wall. We that drifts in and out of doors into musty bathrooms that feel wet all the time. How many ordinances exist? Local communities flailing, streaming into night as would fish into night. What kind of brilliant stare in their scrubbed features, their lips smacking on cream cheeses? I want to laugh, but repulsion invades the body and makes it want to pee. Every silent wailing could find its place in these acts, where the other meets the self, meat flesh. Just order the fucking latte. I am a living example, bootstrap fool, hanger honor. Is there a thing to recover? National dialogues on the blotted screen, everywhere is down here, from here, they say, unless, unless. A voice is bare and audible, it mouths, my father is half his normal weight and in a bed in Hartford Hospital. Hollows or glass, fragments of being, being or nothing, near not being, pre precisely what the body resists the body is. They turn the television on for comfort. They tuck the sheets and pull them into neat corners, edges of order. 
We had a house full of books. I collected them as I would bugs. Hindrance of the dreaded, fortitude and enemy alliances, a free man, some say he's shackled, walks into the me on the subway station and steals something, I'm not sure what. At home, the house stinks of the dead. We never mention the way the rooms wilt with it. We paint the floor, collect the beer cans from the basement and look sad. All five things have been distributed. A Timex watch, $152.32 in coins. A wallet photo from 1974, a certain longing, a bathrobe. Before the effort and desire, one hurries into the porn store and then hurries out again. She is the only one hurrying. Everyone else is motionless. Recover, e, ing. One remembers being someone's girl, the possession of someone else, that kind of safety. For what, then, flip flap of pages turning? Here is the size of a hole. Here is the size of what happened before and of no one watching. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Like this, Alice? Um, I'm Carl Phillips. I'll read for sort of brief poems. Almost tenderly. It had the heft of old armor, like a breastplate of bronze, like a shield on hinges. It swung apart like a door. Inside it, the sea was visible, the sea and on the shore, a man, stripped, beaten, very gently, tenderly almost, as if to the man, to calm him, but in fact to no one, the sea was singing. Here, in the deepening blue of our corruption, let love be at least one corruption we chose together. But the man said nothing. Why not call restlessness our crown and our dominion? sang the sea. But the man was a brokenness like any other, moving until it fails to move, the way over time suffering makes no difference. His wounds were fresh, still open. Where the light fell on them, they flashed like the sea. This is called volition. We lay steep in summertime. We'd let our bodies by their own gravity settle into the stillness of it, where they move now with the sluggish grace of plants under water when they moved at all. Peaceful, but the kind of peace that comes just after the laying of arms down in surrender, which is to say it felt a lot like defeat, as if we'd come to an end finally not so much of wickedness itself as of an impulse toward it that we'd long ago, having straddled it, thought we'd mastered. And yet here we were, as if thrown, dismounted, but never quite hitting the hard ground of reason, reason itself having given way. We had nothing but instinct now in a world where moral valence no longer seemed to apply. A bruise could be triumph, could be one more sunset, could be perversion. And the question was not how to tell the difference, but who's to say we have to or should? 
It was as if morality, like light, were now refractable. We could see the colors, but what do colors mean, ever, except what we want them to, and nothing at all? We lay steep in a stillness that anyone might confuse with paralysis, or with a stalemate between recklessness and detachment as they vie for possession of a single body. But it wasn't that. Couldn't we turn away whenever we chose to? Any moment, we kept telling ourselves, so often that it seemed sometimes we already had turned, but as from a violent hand to which nevertheless the mind still attaches some small affection. We draw the hand briefly close again, so as almost to kiss it, yes, before letting it go. Now in our most ordinary voices. There's a kind of shadow land that one body makes entering another. And there's a shadow land the body contains always within itself, without resolution, as mystery a little more often perhaps should be. For a moment, somewhere between the two, I can see myself as I begin to think you must see me, a stranger to helplessness, spouting things like, to know is to live flayed, and ambition means turning the flesh repeatedly back toward the whip, not away. I can still hear myself saying that, believing it. Now it all sounds wrong. Look at the trees, willows mostly. They move in that way, willows move, as if wanting to pace themselves slow impossibly in a building wind, as if the wind were fate and the tree's response one that could maybe make a difference. Frankly, it's the inevitability part that I most adore still in the inevitable. It makes of blame an irrelevance. We'll take up once more the two positions that favoring depth over range We've mastered finally. This time, it's your turn to be the bonfire. I'll be the distance through which the bonfire, unspecifiable, could at first be any small point of restlessness, lit, contained, in a blackening field. Well, I'll just finish with this super short poem. <coughs> Excuse me. Called cathedral and suddenly strangely there was also no fear either as a horse in harness to what inevitably must break it no torch no lantern and yet no hiddenness now no hiding Leaves flew through where the wind sent them flying. Thanks. Hello, can you hear me? I want to thank Vita and Alice and Sean for all the good care. I want to thank all the other poets I haven't heard some of them read for a long time. <clears throat> I apologize for running out on you if I was going to cough and ruin your reading. So I coughed outside in the hallway <laughs> uh, so I wouldn't mess with it. In the 20th century, 
Believe it or not, we had 105 million war dead. And in this 21st century, we're beginning again. A poem simply called Peace, a poem for Maxine Green. Peace, what is it? Is it an animal, a bird, a plane, a mineral, a color, a drum beat? Do ba ba ba, do ba ba ba, do da 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 di. Is it a verb, a noun, an adjective, a prophet with no pockets circling our paragraph lives? Do ba 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 ba, do da 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 ba ba ba, do da ba, do da ba, do da ba. Du Bois said the cause of war is the preparation of war. Du Bois said the cause of war is the preparation of war. I say the cause of peace must be the preparation of peace. I say the cause of peace must be the preparation of peace. Blah, blah, blue. Blah, blah, blue, 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 blue. Should I prepare a table of peace before you in the presence of mine enemies? Shall I prepare a table of peace? Will you know how to eat at this table? Skiggy, did I die? Do that, do that, ba, boo, da, ba, boo, ba, da, 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 boo, da, boo, da, da, ba, 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 boo, do, boo, do, do, boo, do, boo, do. Where are the forks of peace? Where are the knives of peace? Where are the spoons of peace? Where are the eyes of peace? Where are the hands of peace? Where are the tongues of peace? Where are the children of peace? Peace, peace, ding, 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 peace, ding, 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 is peace. An action, a way of life. Is it a tension in our earth body? Is peace you and I seeing beyond bombs and babies roasting on the country road? Boom, 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 boom. Peace must not be still. We have to take it on the road, marching against Pentagon doors, lurking in obscenity. Peace must not find us on our knees while the country holds hostage the hearts and penises of the workers. Bleep, bleep, blue. Bleep, bleep, bleep. Do, 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 do,
sing a poem called Peace. <clears throat> A man by the name of Max Roach died this last year. And um, I wrote Ten Haku for him, a great, great percussionist. One, nothing ends, every blade of grass remembering your sound. Your sounds exploding in the universe return to earth in prayer. Doom, boom, 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 doom, boom, doom, 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 As you drum, your hands kept reaching for God. For the morning sky so lovely imitates your laughter. Five, you came warrior clear your music kissing our spines. Six, you came drumming sweet life on sails of flesh. <laughs> feet tapping, singing in peach, our blood. Feet tapping, singing in peach, our blood. <laughs> Your fast beat riding the air settles in our bones. Ah, Your drums soloing our breaths into the beat on beat. Your fast beat riding the air settles in our bones. Your drums soloing our breaths into the beat, of the beat, to the beat, and 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 beat. Your hands shimmering on the legs of rain. Your hands shimmering on the legs of rain. Your hands shimmering, 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 My name is Quincy Troop, and I'm going to um, <clears throat> going to read uh, two sections of my title poem of my book, The Architecture of Language, uh, section nine, and the last section, eleven. Great language is a shower of words inside a blizzard of tongues full of rhythms and syllables. It's a flow, it's snowstorms of meaning coming and going everywhere our ears turn. Here, rainstorms, tornadoes, lightning boats, unzipping clouds towering around the calm, savage eye of hurricanes. It's a flow coming and going, bringing new systems of music. New ways of listening connected to hearing. Structures carrying a host of evolving languages. Rawling tongues inside crotalized, cross-fertilized speech of immigrants and new poetry. Is a flow also located in the evil eye of Katrina. 
Rita, swirling in from the Gulf of Mexico, carrying thunder and death, foaming with cataclysmic omens, terrors beyond any understanding, categories beyond any knowing what horror will bring through cracks of daylight, destruction unfolding, rancid bodies bloated, floating in toxic water, is a language, is a flow we hear but do not know how to recognize 30-foot storm surges speaking in tongues more violent than any language we think we hear or know, is a flow disjunctive beyond any application of money, is perhaps a cosmic spiritual payback for bug-eyed children who mirror the language of hunger, murder, no sympathy or empathy for blues people festering in a place full of heat. Water, mosquitoes, poisonous snakes, high prices for gasoline, for cars, thirsty for petrol. Is a flow of anarchy spreading like a plague in this place. New Orleans is a form of language ignited by Category 5 winds and angry seawater, foaming salt and screaming in the voodoo language of the sea goddess Urzuli. Hugans blowing calamities ashore through their mouths of long bamboo horns. It's perhaps a payback for all the terrors released in this flow. When coffins, mummified corpse, corpses, leering skeletons, to bones unearthed by Katrina's savage flooding tongue or scattered like dead leaves and broken branches all over Louisiana's devastated countryside. It tracks the fall post haste of America's once promise of greatness, lost here in this macabre jumble of unknown spirits evicted from their graves with no names, identity, no race ticket or skin color has privilege in this place of spirits displaced, scattered from far former resting places of chipped tombstones also scattered, their skulls reminding us of broken teeth of ex-fighters, junkies, these corpses grinning teeth set in jaws of cracked bone, is a powerful language screaming for redemption. If we look deeply into this moment, it reveals our true selves in these spaces we live in, corrupted by greed, skin color, class, religion, power at all costs, is a definite language suffocating in claustrophobia, ethnophobia, no connection to the real world, to the flow, caca growth of humane language, poetry inside the most profound beauty of utterance, sing still inside the deepest grain of that flowering word, sound by sound, word by word, speech evolves into beautiful architecture, creates a scaffolding of cross-fertilized utterances, cross being inside poetic sentences fused with music where metaphors spring from deepest sources of community. These are the seas that will link, bond us together. Levin. Thunderclaps of vials, raging rivers flooding, conversations, carrying languages coming and going. As the wind blows a mango out of a tree, it speaks to the moment it hits the ground. In the future, there will be new sounds when buzzing flies start feasting on the mango's sweet nectar as its flesh rots away, sinks into a swarm of feverish maggots. Is a kind of language whispering close to silence, speaking inside this moment. It marks an instant inside time, like music musicians or poets writing the rhythms of wind, the ocean's improvisational breath of misty salt water. Now, catapulting a fish into the sky locks us into the moment, as does the bootylicious murmur of a woman's taunt flesh, rubbing bodaciously up against silk, evokes sinful dreams in men and women I know, po a politically incorrect thought I know, though true in the track of reality flow, is seductive as kisses, tonguing inside passion sweetly, sucking sounds flowering in sock lock miles as she pulls you deep into the volcano of her song, bodies moving instinctively now, poetically, mysteriously, bodies come alive in the moment, on time, not behind time, as when poetry is poured into language, great sounds of music scaffolding up buildings, architraves of syllables, hanging off edges of pursed lips like dripping notes there, can be heard building into an improvised cadenza as it flourishes when sound is thrust into the sky as an 
an inventive idea. It's like a wondrous sleek building and eagles soaring above it. Architecture can create memorable language up there. Pointing fingers up toward where religion swears God is. Where well, we know, though, the spirit of great poetry sings and lives. Good evening. I'm Arthur Michael Weaver, the last one. <laughs> and I will read uh, three poems. Thelonious for Jean. It's as if you are given the sky to carry, lift it on your shoulders and take it to lunch, sit in McDonald's with it weighing you down. This business of being black, of staying black until the darkness of some eternity kisses you. Birth gives you something other folk thank God for not having, or else they pray for it. To have its gift of a body inclined to touch, inclined to sing, yet they will not give back to God the paleness of being able to touch absolute power. They envy only for so long as being black is being bound to danger. Among us there are masters like Monk who understood the left hand stride on a brick. In his rapturous dance beside the piano, he was connected to knowing the scratch and slide of the shoes leaving the ground, the shoes of the lynched men. He carried this thing that we are as the mystic he was, reveling in its magic, respectful of its anger, mute and unchanged as the hate and envy surround us. One day we learn there is no sky above this trapped air around the earth. The sky is but a puff of smoke from this giant head smoking a lucky strike, pretending not to know the truce. We learn sometimes in this life, sometimes in what comes after, where there is really nothing but everything we never knew. We learn in silence, the dance monk knew. We find secrets for pulling the million arrows from our souls each time we move to sleep to forget that we are both jewel and jetsam, wanted and unforgiven. Sacred for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a poem in two parts. One, moratorium on the Vietnam War. In the autumn after your leaving, we climb trees in the mall to hear your widow speak to the silence you left beside her at night. The trick of moonlight in the bedroom window pasting her tears to cotton we climbed up adolescent and full, dumb to the bells that toll on the other side of Providence. The jeeps and tanks protecting our white houses, so long and deep the groaning wish of pastors in southern dust and wooden churches with no conditioned air. Only the spirituals, gospels of life and death, howling in the woods, blood crawling up the measures of a raw open flesh, the registers of soul making the blues, the jazz. We climbed into the deadness of trees gone bare to prepare for Washington's winter. Jefferson sculpted on the other end in his stoniness, his eyes on the nation, on us, in these perches where we heard the world of some near half million of us protesting the war we later would go to. A jungle, heat, Fire, napalm, monsoons, like the endless melting of envy. The surprise of women and children tossing bombs at us after smiling. And who teaches us to smile but innocence and suffering? The frailty of age, gone as we are after youth, 
after immortality, this war we could not see, but would prepare to live. Later, some of us in trees, training to shoot people who do not know where we are, how we breathe, why we shoot to take life away, the way piety and sanctity guaranteed death. Two, many thousands gone. Maybe creation came as God cried, the tears, the violent origin of ego, the doubling, two, four, eight, 64, software and apocalypse, our false divinity, so that death is the oneness, three, five, seven, numbers knowing themselves as one, life blossoming to thinness, invisibility away from the balcony, the rifle cracking the peace of gazing out on the day with your plans, then the lifting back into the place where there is nothing, where oneness relieves itself of thinking. In the midst of one and two, there is the dream you dreamed of the end of perfection, how the sacred wisdom is realizing we cannot fix anything, not even our eyes on the first moments of a morning, the cakewalk of wasp to whippoorwill, the bliss of an old blind dog finding his way to his food, the southern way of studying a soul, an epiphany Martin Luther could not invoke with his prayers. Enraged by the ballet of chestnuts and Tetzel with his indulgences, enraged into a pious madness. A new calling of the imperfect away from us, wishing death on Abraham and Sarah's children. You saw this too, pulling away from earth, from the doubling, one for the moon, one for the sun, your heart and mind now one flying away over everything we know, connecting masses, stars and galaxies, now the one light that knows this world is mist and fog, a simple longing. <clears throat> My heart for Laurie. If ever they trace the lines of my chest with ink as you trace them with your tongue, kiss me first, hold my tongue to yours, pull it until it goes numb, paste your lips to mine until I can taste your birth. If ever they open me and the bluebirds come rushing out, I want to hear you sing in the flutter of wings. This is the way things are healed. This is how the tired travelers gaze into the eye to be sustained. And when the blood goes rushing away from me, like children who have opened a forbidden spout, touch something of mine. Hold me that way to know that I want to hold you more than life itself, but a choice must be made. Some vinegar must go where agony cries out already, enough. I hang in the tiny crochet and feeble hands as they give me a stranger's heart. If all of this is just a dream and you fly away from me before the gray takes over, I will touch you everywhere I go. I will declare the world your body and christen our children in the air of names. Thank you. <clears throat> 